all that you're doing And I praise you in thankfulness I praise you And I praise you in thankfulness I praise you And thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord And I thank you Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. And I praise you, Lord, in thankfulness. I praise you. I praise you, Lord, in thankfulness. I praise you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord, in thankfulness. I praise you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord, in thankfulness. I praise you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. I remember, Lord, that all that you've done. And I praise you, Lord, in thankfulness. I praise you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord, in thankfulness. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. And I thank you, Lord, for all that you're
Good morning, Ascend. Let's stand and pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday morning. And I just sense that there's this precious spirit that's going to be upon us today. Um, if there's anyone here that needs to remember the tenderness, the gentleness, the kindness of Jesus, I just pray that you would uh, let those barriers down this morning and realize that it is Him who fulfills your every need. Open the door that He stands on the other side of. He wants to come in this morning. For those of you who are battling shame and guilt, know that He is your Savior, that He is kind and He is loving, and He accepts you just as you are. So as He tugs on your heart this morning, let all the barriers down, let the walls down and just come come to him so lord we lift up this service to you we just pray that there would be courage in our hearts to come to you and to let you into those places that you need to come that you want to come and heal and deliver in jesus name amen
For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve glory. The glory to your name. All glory to. Glory to your name, Jesus. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. Yes, sing that. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. And better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day, better is one day, the thousands elsewhere, the thousands elsewhere, the thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere, the thousands elsewhere, the thousands elsewhere, the thousands elsewhere, the thousands elsewhere. You're all I want You're all I want Lord. You're all I want You're all I want Lord You're all I want You're all we want Lord You're all we want You're all Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. You are worthy of
And I love your presence And I love, I love I love your presence And I love, I love And I love you, Jesus I love, I love Yeah. 
Fill me 
Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your presence. I really feel the Spirit of God here, maybe for the next moment or so. If you could just lay hands on the person next to you, let's believe for his kingdom to come. Go ahead and be filled with the Holy Spirit afresh. I'm fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit right now. You can pray in the Holy Spirit. Let rivers flow out of your belly into your, into your neighbor. Release the kingdom of God um, into your neighbor. The Bible says you have the kingdom of heaven within you. And out of your belly will flow rivers. Out of your belly will flow rivers. Go ahead, Judah. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come right now. Be healed in your bodies in the name of Jesus Christ. Cancer die. Lower back pain. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be filled. Be filled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, fire. Bend it, bend it, bend it, bend it. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Forever, forever. Yours is the power. The glory forever. Thank you, Mark. You are all we want. You are all Phil. we want. Phil. Yeah, Judah, come on. You are come all on, we Judah. Want. Phil. You are all we yeah. want. Bande, Bande, Phil. You are Aced all it, we want. Aced it. You are Phil. all we want. My 
says in the last days he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh sons and daughters prophesy dream dreams see visions Lord open it up open it up over us I pray ears to hear the spirit of God flow in our homes touch our children thank you Lord be glorified. Most of all, tenderize our hearts, Lord, to love you more. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way. Yeah, as, Ju as Judah sang, we do say, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Have your way. Holy Spirit, glorify Jesus. Jesus, walk the aisles this morning like have your way. Let your word go forth. Penetrate hearts. Soften the soul of our hearts to receive the seed of your word. Thank you, Lord God. You are the bread of life. Come down, O bread of life. Afresh again this morning. Thank you. Thank you that you are life. Thank you, Lord, that you are life. And life more abundantly you've come for. Thank you, Jesus. Omega symbol. Um, I believe the Lord's wanting to bring something to a close and finish and complete something. If that may, I know it's a bit vague and broad, but I just saw really clearly Omega symbol. Um, he's wanting to be the Omega and something that's open ended. It needs to complete and come to a close. If, if that's you, you can just bless your hand over your heart and all of our family across the world online. Just receive that by faith. Thank you, Lord, that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And right now, in the name of Jesus, finish what you've started. Bring a completion right now, the perfected completion of God's work in your life. That which he started, he will complete. Completion right now, in the name of Jesus. The ending of seasons to start a new one. The ending of that opposition that has not come to a close, the Omega, go forth in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Be glorified. Be pleased. Man, do you mind singing that again? Um, you are awesome in this place. And just receive the Holy Spirit. Let's sing that together to Jesus. Oldie but goodie. Sing that right to Jesus, just you and him. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this mighty God. Sing that again. You are awesome in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Be glorified, Lord. You are awesome in this place of the Father. You are worthy of our praise. To our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place. Mighty God. Shambam Brambam Dosto. You are awesome in this place. Thank you. 
Stay where you're at. I know many of you are still in the presence or you can find a seat. And so excited for this morning, super expectant. Have a, a couple of quick announcements, give you an opportunity to give, and then a very special guest. Please hold your applause. I want to take a minute to honor dear, dear friend uh, Ben Fitzgerald is with us this morning. Look, get, find some seat belts or something in your chair. It's going to get wild. Incredible, incredible man of God. I want to honor him in a second. But... um. I think the the only announcement that I can recall is coming up for our student body. I didn't realize it, but our, our student body is still, I mean, because we changed the model, our students know, super grateful for what all the Lord's doing and trying to follow his voice, but it's still super strong. We hadn't moved on numbers at all, so because we were going to open up our fellowship Fridays to possibly um, the public as well. We're just not there yet, so our student body is still quite quite sizable. So Fellowship Friday will be students only is my point. Please know that it's still, um, if you're a student, you can audit people in. If you, if you find a student and want to come to our Fellowship Friday, um, you can find a student and audit in through them. I feel the presence, man. It's hard to do like, go hurry up and go to like practical, boring announcements. Uh, but anyway, so, but it's not until I think February 2nd, is it okay? Yeah, thank you so much. Because we're in a fast, uh, obviously. Um, how's that going for everybody? Doing good. <laughs> Falling in love with broccoli all over again, and <laughs> praise Him. Um, so grateful. It's been super rich. We're deep into it though. This thing's coming to a, a close. So, um, but we'll finish that. I think the 28th is our last day, and then go. I'm mayhem on the 29th. <laughs> buffets and. Um, but anyway, February 2nd, we're going to bump it back, that Fellowship Friday to February 2nd um, here. It's going to be a big blowout, badminton, ping pong, in the glory, eating a bunch of good stuff and hanging out. But students only, so please remember. Um, Wednesdays, that was another one. We'd love to um, have you should you feel led. It's a new kind of model. We open up the doors to the public on Wednesdays. It's been getting super rich. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And really, it's the whole second half of the day is wide open. You know, we know many people have to work, and but there's something special about knowing you have a place you can come to should you want to. Many people have a sweet spot at home, and that's awesome as well. But some people have live in apartments and got dogs next door and people trampling. You ever have the people over you on the second floor, and they just do it like, oh, taking broomsticks and pounding the ceiling? But just know we're all locked in over here on Wednesdays, and you can come get away as much as you want, a little as you want, um, but more of a uh, mystical slant starting at two, waiting upon the Lord. Um, I shared this with our students on Wednesday night. Our first one, Zoe, right at the tail end of it, um, probably around four o'clock, went into a vision where the Lord started in this section. She saw Jesus starting to walk every aisle, and as he'd walk right by the people, um, you know, he'd come right by in, in each aisle, and she said it wasn't like it was gold, but it was kind of like golden light. How many of you love visions? It's super biblical, but he would walk by the people, and it would, it would fall on the people, and they would start to illuminate. And I think it's very scriptural. He's illuminating the eyes of our heart and just helping us know him more. 
And um, anyway, that's open. Love to have you. And uh, that's every Wednesday night. I think that's it. So I want to give you an opportunity to give and then cannot wait, man. So love Ben dearly. Oh, I want to take a second to honor him um, after we come back after this video. But just want to pray as well. I have a quick verse, Proverbs 11, verse 24. You don't have to turn there. But I love it. It's, it's a good principle biblically on reminding us to live a generous life. And just, uh, man, this is just the biblical way. You want to lock into it, just stay into it for the long haul. Tithes and offerings, but also just being a generous person, cheerful giver. It says, there is one who scatters, Proverbs eleven twenty four yet increases more. And there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. How many of you know, at least my, my mindset in the natural is often to kind of, if you want more, you hang on to more. You guys know what I mean? If the bills get tight, it's like, yeah, that's when you hang on to more. But crystal clear throughout scripture, he says, the more you scatter, you end up becoming more prosperous. It's, it's very backwards to the natural way of thinking. And I love that, and I, you guys know this, that have been with us for quite some time. I just wanted on all of us to have the Bible opened up over our life. It would be fully submitted to it, and we'd be a generous people for His glory. I don't care if you end up going to China and, you know, planting our own church. Just be that there. It's not about so much here. It's just being biblical people and uh, having no room for the enemy to cut off paths of our life that God intends to shine through. And uh, I love this one so there's one who scatters yet increases more. May we be a generous people and um, just want to bless you guys. So you sh should have offering envelopes, checks made payable to us in church. Here's all the ways to give. We'll pray and, uh, and then be right back. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for biblical principles that are so clear that we can live a generous life and unlock your abundance and provision for your glory that you may be glorified. And I pray that in return over our family, both in the house and across the world online, may the blessing of God consume you. May his goodness and mercy chase after you all the days of your life. Thank you, Lord, for your abundance, opening up heaven over them. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome, we'll be right back. Thank you, Jesus. Who's ready? <laughs> Who, who's hungry? Come on. So I want to take a second to honor Ben Fitzgerald. Listen, he's an incredible, incredible man of God, constantly challenging my life and has impacted my life and continues to. Every time I'm with him, um, doing amazing things all over the world. But right now, he may tell you some more about it. They're based in Germany. His dear pastor friend, Demi, wave at him, Demi. He's also a pastor under uh, Ben Fitzgerald, Pastor Ben, really. He's a pastor now. Me and Ben are pastors. Yeah. And, um, and uh, but an incredible, incredible work over uh, awakening over in Germany. So they've got a church doing just in massive impact around the world. I know their largest event, he said, is coming up even next year, which I'm like, I don't know how that's going to look because he's already, they pack out stadiums, evangelistic, you name it, just touching the world on all fronts. And uh, what I love most about him, though, he's the real deal, does not hold back, loves the pure word of God, is a man of character, wisdom, purity, and uh, preaches the gospel that cuts to the heart back by the glory of God. 
strong, strong deliverance too. He never talks about it, it just happens. He loves Jesus and talks about Jesus. So if you need to get free, got a few devils hanging around, they'll be gone by the end of the service and it's gonna be good. But I really just wanna encourage you to be expectant. I uh, love to always quote this, James 121, to have humble, meek hearts that receive the implanted word of God, getting low and come under it with hunger and expectations. If you guys could please stand and honor the one and only Ben Fitzgerald. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, come on, give praise to the Lord. Give praise to the King. <clears throat> Jesus, we love you. We need you, Lord. The church is nothing without you, it's boring. We love your presence. You came, Lord, and we came for you. You came for us and we came for you. What a phenomenal privilege it is, Lord Jesus, to understand and to know and to have the veil pulled back to see your presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your heart. Thank you for your life. We thank you. I just found myself this morning just saying, thank you, Father, for showing me Jesus, for revealing Jesus to me. Thank you, my King. Father, I pray that your word, which is better than any preacher, would do its work this morning. Father, I pray that it would change us, that this very morning, Lord, that there would be an increase in the way we see you and the way we see others. And Father, we ask you that you would not let us return home today the same, that there would be a change. Yes. We do not come before your very presence, before your throne, before the living word of God and expect to be unchanged, but to be further made into your glory and in your will. And Father, I give you praise for this house. I thank you for everything you're doing here. And I actually have a prophetic impression that as I was just standing up the back there with, with Pastor Brian, <laughs> it's true, we're both pastors now. I feel like every time I hear that, I almost can't believe it, that I'm a pastor. But anyway, uh, I had this impression as I was over there just worshiping the Lord. That, and I saw Jesus, a picture of Jesus sitting right here on the stage like this, just right on the stage, just joyfully sitting. And I felt like he's found a place in the Atlanta area where he can rest. And the Lord loves places where he's honored and adored and where he can rest. And I just saw that picture of him just sitting right there, just smiling and looking at people. And he really deeply loves you. And this is a house where the Lord can be himself. And, um, and that's an incredible thing. It means you're on the right track in the way that we're adoring God. But I did sense something in the spirit that Jesus was doing as well. For most people, he, I just could sense he was looking at them with eyes of love. But for a few people, I could sense he was just looking at them. The way Jesus is, is his countenance is piercing. It pierces everything that is not right. It turns everything upside down. It, it takes every dark area that's uncovered and exposes it. And I could see Jesus just exposing a few motives of people's hearts. And the scripture came to me that, you know, hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you came here for any other reason than the Lord Jesus Christ, you might become disappointed. But if you came for the Lord and you came to honor his house, his ways, to have community and fellowship with God, then your heart will rest in him the same way he rests here. So this is a house for his rest and for his glory. But it has to be the same in your heart. You have to find your rest in the person of Jesus. If you came here for another reason, it will ultimately fail. And he will never fail. You have amazing leadership here. He's, Brian's a phenomenal friend of mine, beautiful man of God, someone I greatly admire and and, uh, and it's not about the leaders. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it to you. I could sense Jesus was joyful, just resting, but he was looking at some people's hearts and that some people have motives that this morning the Lord just wants to help you to let go of. He doesn't want to condemn. He reveals so he can heal. And he reveals so he can free us into more of his presence. So perhaps this morning, if that's you, you just might want to just close your eyes and just say, 
Holy Spirit, I know there's a few things in me that a few motives I have or a bit of jealousy here or a little bit of something else that isn't quite right in my heart. Help me this morning to get things right. Help me to fix my hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we do pray that. We pray, Lord God, that our hearts would be clean, that our motives and intentions for being at this place would be pure, and that all we do, Lord, would be unto your glory. And Father, we ask you this morning that you would champion your gospel and show us the ways of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Everybody say, Amen. Amen. Well, before you get seated, would you turn to your neighbor and say, you look like Jesus. You're made in his image. (laughs) For some of you, it's, you physically look like Jesus. I feel like, um, I don't know, I feel like I need, a, if, if I just say this, maybe I'm saying it prophetically, I need a haircut so bad I look like Moses' grandson or something. <laughs> um, you like it? Someone's yelled out they like it. Well, that's enough encouragement for me today. So if there's any hairdresser, though, who d- does feel it's the will of the Lord while I'm here, uh, I need your help, so come see me at the end of service. Um, Pastor Brian, I want to say pastor because we can be funny about that stuff, but the truth is God puts graces and offices and really I think my friend Brian is a prophet and that's my opinion and I'm sticking to it because everything he's told me, uh, even when I didn't, I was like, wow, that, I, my plan was to go left and he was like, no, the Lord's saying you're going right and I was like, I love how his accent even, he was like, yeah, I feel the Lord saying no, you know, I was like, I was like, oh man, I really want to plant that Bible college. He's like, yeah. No, not yet. And, uh, and he was right. And he was right. So it's an incredible honor to be here with you, with Judah, with Zoe, with your family. And uh, I'm just so thankful. And I take this, um, really, this is a huge privilege for me. I don't take it lightly at all. I say to people around the world when I travel and preach that I'd rather, um, I, I say it's a greater honor to preach to the body of Christ than it would be to preach to a president. Um, in, in fact, recently, uh, in 2017, a few years ago, I prophesied over a lady who worked in the government uh, in a nation in Europe, and she worked at a lower level of government. She's a Christian. And I had my hand on her shoulder, and I felt to say to her, I just sensed the Lord saying this, to be bold, Ben. God sometimes encourages me to be very bold, and, and I don't want to always be bold. But he tells me to do it. And he said to me, tell this woman, if she obeys me, she'll be the leader of her nation. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> and it's a European country. Well, I got a message from her at the end of last year. She's now the leader of the nation. And as she's a Christian, so she's a head of state. So I go and see her in a few, uh, few weeks when I get back to Europe. But the thing is, like, to me, she's amazing, amazing woman. But I would rather speak to the body of Christ than to even presidents. And I'll tell you why. Because you can't hold that as some kind of very powerful thing. You, that's just a human It's just an office that God gives to people. But when you speak to the body of Christ, you are talking to the world's most powerful force. There is no force in the earth that has the power to save, the power to bring Jesus into nations, the power to to glorify the Lord and camp around his presence and for the glory to come and heal a sick person, a dead person. I mean, I just heard a testimony two days ago of a man in the body of Christ, just like we're in together, And he's in a different kind of stream to you, maybe a little bit. But he prayed. He was in, his daughter died when she was born. And the nurse, I don't know what was the deal with the nurse, but this nurse was like possessed with the enemy. And she starts saying, see, you waited too long to bring your wife here. You waited too long. And and the, the daughter, as they gave birth, was completely dead. And, uh, and then he felt the, the word of the Lord come on him. And then he said, I, I need time to pray. And he started to pray. And anyway, around 10 minutes later, I mean, this baby was dead. They gave him a little bit of time. The wife's obviously grieving and he was praying, but this nurse was just speaking death. And, uh, and then anyway, he prays and he cried out to God. And around 10 minutes later, the baby started to breathe. That baby is still alive today. And, and when... When the baby started to breathe, all of a sudden, all the nurses come back rushing in, you know, and kind of grab the baby and everything. And the same nurse said, she goes, oh, the baby's now breathing. She goes, but this baby will be brain dead. She's just speaking weird stuff, you know. And uh, and he knew the Bible. 
This is why it's important that you know this book. You've got to hide your life between the covers of this book. You've got to make this your not Sunday bread, daily bread. You have to. And you've got to know it because you, you have to have an answer for those who accuse you. That's what the Psalms say. And that's what it says in Isaiah 54. It says, when every tongue that rises against you, let's say that's spiritual forces. It says, doesn't say God will condemn. It says, you shall condemn, which means the word of the Lord has to be in our mouth. So this man said, he said, well, my daughter will be fine. He goes, Lazarus was dead three days and he turned out all right. And the daughter is completely fine. She's completely healed. Imagine if he didn't know the Bible though, he would be afraid. But what I'm getting at is this, no one, no entity on earth can see the power of God like that apart from the church. So I consider this a ginormous privilege to speak to a Christian, to a person who could, if they say yes to God and get possessed with the will of God, literally change the lives of millions of people, the eternal lives. And that's what I wanna talk about this morning. I felt like God very strongly told me to talk about His heart and His deep love for humanity. I don't feel that this church is lacking in revelation. I don't feel this church is not a resting place for the Lord, it is. I don't feel this church is even lacking in love. I can sort of sense this swell of God's love and presence between you guys that I sense you're in a season. I don't know this because Pastor Brian and I didn't talk about this necessarily, but I sense you're in a season where you together are starting to commune stronger. You're starting to get to know people more and, and get around each other and pray and, and pray in your homes, eat together. And that koinonia, the fellowship of the Spirit is happening more. So that's beautiful. We're meant to love one another. Yeah, I saw some people hugging each other and touching each other and that's wonderful. But sometimes what we need though, once we have been touched, we need to touch the world. And I wanna, and I wanna preach to you out of the Word of God and out of my personal testimony about how the Lord changed my heart this morning. But first, let me show you a little bit about what's happening in Europe. This is an altar call, a picture of one of our events. Uh, we see a man running to the front. This is what's happening in Europe. Uh, okay, it's on this side, okay. I was looking at my back of my hair that needs a haircut. <laughs> there you go. Uh, this man was running. This man uh, drove, I think, around 15 hours or so to that event. He was about to commit suicide. And he was the first person, he said, there's no hope left for me. He wanted to commit suicide, somebody invited him. And he was the first person to answer the altar call in Europe. And this man was saved radically. And he was so saved that he jumped the barrier of that fence. Our security wasn't quick enough. And he ran up on the stage and, and he really got delivered. And, uh, and that night there was about a, probably about 700 people gave their lives to the Lord Jesus in Vienna. And, um, and this is what we're seeing in Europe. The next one is another woman. She's at the front of the altar call. This woman, you see her right arm, her left arm, sorry. See her arm covered in scars. This is what Jesus is doing in Europe. When people say it's dead in Europe, there's no hope for the European church, they're not telling you the full picture. Yes, it's 2.5% Christian. Yes, Europe is a dark place. Yes, many of the churches there have died. But there's also a huge uprising of people like you who truly love the lamb and not just love the lamb, but love the, the people that don't know him. And so we're seeing this happen in thousands and thousands of people every year turning to Jesus in Europe. And this is a mighty testimony of what God can do through simple obedience, because I'm not from Europe, I'm an Australian. And when I went over there, they had a different culture, different way, different feeling of life. It was quite a challenge to live. You can take that off, thank you so much. Quite a challenge to live as a missionary when I first moved over there because nobody spoke English. And I remember I used to every day tell people here about Jesus. And I'd say, you know, hey, Jesus loves you. I, I studied in Redding, California. I was a pastor at Bethel Church and I would speak about Jesus every day. And when I moved to Germany, no one spoke English. And I remember thinking, wow, it's so different culturally. How, God, are you gonna reach the church? How? And today I wanna preach to you the how, God reaches people because he grips you and me first with love. A president can change laws. You can change the eternal course of human history. A president can make things better economically. You can snatch somebody out of the fire of hell. It's the work of Jesus, but it's through you. It's very profound when we get deep into this. But I wanna start a little bit of this um, with scripture and then a testimony of how God changed me. But would you first go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4? 
And whenever we read Bible verses, even if I know them, I don't know them. I always approach the word with seven levels of deep revelation. I'm always looking to exegete scripture even more and dig. I'm always trying to dig. Sometimes I'll sit there for an hour and a half and just read two, three chapters and just dig with Jesus out of, out of the scripture. So 1 Timothy chapter two, we read from the beginning of 1 Timothy. It's right before 2 Timothy. <laughs> chapter two, verse one says this. Therefore, I exhort you first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Say all men. men. Okay, what does this mean? First, let's stop here. Paul is saying, I want you to pray for everyone. I don't want you to be selective. Zacchaeus up in that tree saying to Jesus, like climbing up there to see the Lord and Jesus saying, today I'll eat in your house. He was talking very unselectively in a culture where they were very selective. They're like, you don't talk to tax collectors. You don't eat with Samaritans. Even Levite priests wouldn't touch a Samaritan who was beaten up. So there was a level of hypocrisy, but there was a level of separation. And we do the same thing. God, I pray that you would save my best friend because they're my best friend. But oh boy, we're on the phone, ringing our Christian friends, complaining about our demonic boss at work. But it's all men that God loves. It's all people. And you don't know that your boss at work might become the next Billy Graham. You don't know. And, and sometimes what we do is we select. So Paul here is saying, I'm just exhorting you, church, that you pray for every person. Don't think to yourself that I know their heart, God knows their heart. Don't say to yourself, I'm sure that that person's more evil than the other. How do you know? They might be evil now. They might be Paul the Apostle soon. Okay, so praying for all men. Let's jump down. It, it says for kings and those in authority, like we just talked about presence, but let's jump down to verse three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, and now I want to stop there and tell you something. Let's make it. What's your name, friend? David. David. It's a wonderful name. David, uh, when's your birthday? November 16th. November 16th. Okay, so it was not too long ago. So next year, if anyone knows David, they know what, <laughs> when his birthday is now. David, um, let me ask you a question. What's your favorite thing to do in life outside of loving God? Do you have a hobby? He's a massage therapist. Okay, you want to get the massage or do it? Provide. To provide. Wow, this man, are you married yet? Because that, saying that kind of a comment, <laughs> that's going to get you married very fast. <laughs> okay, so you love to provide massage therapy to people. Okay, what a servant. Okay, so let's say this. November the 16th next year, you and I have become best friends. All right, come here for a second. So you and I have become really close. And David and I are hanging every day together. We're hanging every day. We're talking every day. I'm asking him about his life. Um, we well, smells good too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I'm talking to David. So I know David. I know him. So November 16th comes around and then I come to David and say, David, happy birthday. And I give him a cat. I give him a cat. I knew he wanted a massage chair. I knew he wanted a big massage chair. He could sit in and put other people in, but I give him a cat and I hand it to him. David, have I ministered to your heart with the cat? No, sir. Yeah, exactly. No, sir. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Okay. So <clears throat> there's a point to what I'm saying. I want you to slowly read verse four with me. And then picture this, we look at the Father like this, we go, Father, Father, we love you. We bless you. We Philippians for our lives to you, which is this, our supplications, our requests, we present them before God. We are constantly, God, do this for me, do that for me. Please help me here. Father, what can I give you for your birthday? Verse four. This is acceptable in God's sight, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Father, 
How can I bless you? I desire your sister. Father, how can I truly love and bless you? Is it just praise you want? No, I want you to give me something that I desire. I desire all men to be saved. So God is thinking about the world. He's not just thinking about you and me. Let me ask you a question. If I said to you today, if I give you $5 billion, will you give me your salvation? Would you hand it to me? Would you give it to me? Heck no, right? Someone said, heck no. <laughs> if I said, here's 5 billion, 10 billion, would you give me your salvation? Okay, in the church of Christ, how come our salvation and our relationship with God is priority number one? But people who don't know God, my favorite TV show, my time with God, everything that I'm doing, my calling, priority number 19 might be your unsaved brother. It's not a priority to us. And how do we know it's not a priority? It's not because we put up our hand and say, yes, Lord, save the world. It's because our heart doesn't follow, our actions don't follow our words. Our heart is not following what we say. We say to God, save the world. And he says, I desire this. I desire this. And we ignore it all the time. And we make excuses. We, we categorize ourselves in personality groups. We say, I'm not a bold person. That's never true. Every person that's ever come to me and said, Ben, would you pray for me? I want to reach people for Jesus. Or I have fear, pray for me. And I heard them just two minutes before. They say, I'm not good at talking to people. I'm like, hang on, I walked past you in the church cafe. You're like, excuse me, I ordered a double shot. You're very bold about your coffee. You know, women, I've heard women talk to each other about makeup. Oh, have you seen this Maybelline? Oh my goodness, it's non-stick. Da, da, da. They're preachers, they're gospel preacher for Maybelline. We all talk and communicate what we have passion for. We just have to be honest and say, God, something must have changed in me since I met the Lord or I forgot, I forgot that my life was headed to hell. I forgot eternity. I did not consider that I was against you in wrath abiding on me, that I was retrobate, which means this, my mind was an enemy of God. That was my former life. How could we forget that? Do you know why we forget that? Jesus doesn't guilt us when we're with Him. So His presence is joy. It's enjoyable. But there's something in a relationship between David and I and Jesus and I where the relationship is no longer one-sided. There's a depth with the Lord where the relationship becomes you and Jesus and becomes Jesus in you. Like, you're like, Jesus, what do you want? What do you desire? And this is so important to God because God's desires often go unfulfilled through the believer, through the church. They've done studies about this, that 96% of Christians don't lead a single soul to Christ. And all of us, in some sense, are guilty of that. We would never say to somebody, that's one person's fault. What I am saying to us as a church today is we need to be awake to the desires of our Father. This is where true intimacy is formed. Turn to Luke chapter 19. And then I'll get into this testimony. Luke 19. I love the sound of turning Bibles. I'm so thankful. For, I don't like the digital Bible. <laughs> Here's that story again about Zacchaeus. The wrong person, the wrong culture, bad in society in some, the eyes of some. But Jesus, the context here is Jesus says, I'm going to go eat with you today. Verse 9, Jesus says to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Familiar verse? I don't think so. The Holy Spirit said to me around two years ago, study this. 
look deep into this. Greek, Aramaic, look into this. The word seek here, when Jesus says, I, the God of the universe, take on flesh to seek and to save that which is lost, the Greek word is crave. I crave people. It's the same as you not seeing your best friend for three years and they walk out of the airport doors and your heart leaps and you jump to them and you hug them. It's the same as not seeing your family or mother for years and you crave her intimate hug. It's the same as if you had a daughter and your daughter was kidnapped and you were waiting for, for somebody or waiting for the phone call that she's been found. It's the same craving. It's not shallow. It's not, oh yes, we know God loves the lost. No, 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 friend. It's not shallow at all. It is the very reason Jesus came to earth. If we can say that salvation is kind of important, then we're saying to ourselves in the mirror, my salvation was only kind of important. It wasn't kind of important. Look at yourself in the mirror tonight. Go, you have redeemed me. I'm a heavenly being now. My sins are washed away. There is no guilt in me. Hell has been destroyed through the salvation you gave me. I am not going to hell. And then ask yourself, is that kind of important? Kind of? It's not kind of important. It is of the absolute utmost priority. And I can boldly say this to you. I don't like it when preachers say the most important thing to God because I hear the most important thing to God is 50 different things. I don't like making big sweeping statements about the nature of our Father. We have to be careful with that sometimes. But I can confidently say based upon the heartbeat of Jesus, based upon 1 Timothy 2.4, based upon so many other verses, based upon Proverbs 11, the winning of souls and wisdom connected. I can tell you that Jesus, to the Lord, the most important thing to Him was to glorify the Father. The most important thing for us is to love the Lord God with all our hearts, our mind and strength. But then Jesus said, and the second is like it. It's not second like another category. It's like the way it has the same likeness of how you adore God to love your neighbor as you love yourself, to crave a human life, seeing Jesus. Do you realize your best friend, if he died in a car accident today, would be eternally cut off from God? Do you think of this? Is this in your thoughts? Jesus spoke of heaven but he spoke of hell more. The reality of eternal judgment. The enemy hates this so much that we even talk about this subject. I've watched him do this. I've been in places where the power has gone out the second I begin to talk about eternity or start to preach. I've been in places where I could sense such resistance to the message of eternity, eternal life. And most Christians go, yeah, 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 I understand hell. Yeah, yeah I understand it. But that's as shallow as saying, I understand heaven. I don't understand the depths of heaven yet. Last night, uh, Dimi and I, he's one of my wonderful pastors. We watched a testimony of a man named Jesse who went to heaven. And when you hear the depth of heaven, you're like, we only have touched a little bit. We see in part, Paul said. But Paul, that same apostle who talked about heaven, told others and told us, he says, he lives and spends. You know, when people say, I'm spent. It means they have given everything. Paul said he would gladly spend and be spent for your souls. His aim, his mission, the mission of every apostle, the mission of every prophet. Why are there prophets? Prophets aren't there to tell you you're wearing green underwear. They're not there to give you weird words and stuff. They're not there for that. I love what this prophet I love because he will tell you what God is thinking. And there, there's always this reconciliation aspect of it. Like there's a season closing. Like I wouldn't have even thought of the Omega symbol that way. But it's just so, so revealing of the depths of God's wisdom. But many prophets today or many prophetic things are just about, you know, I see a revival coming. We've heard that for 50 years. There's not going to be a revival unless God revives individuals. There's not, we've heard for 50 years, a revival's coming, revival's coming and everybody's waiting. 
But Jesus told His own disciples, your time is now. It has come. The Gospel is now. It's not when somebody else reveals it to you. You have it. You have the answer to the cancer of sin. You have the answer to the eternal judgment, the doorsteps of hell and Hades and Sheol. And see, what happens is in church, some people get that, some. But other people ignore it and then they heap up teachers for themselves with itching ears and they have to get teachers that redefine hell. Let's redefine hell. Let me ask you a question. Let's say, just for argument's sake, hell was only temporary because that's what they do now. They say, well, hell is just an annihilationalism. It's only gonna last for 100,000 years or whatever, or 1,000 years. Do you want anybody there for a day? You want your best friend there for a day? Like, yeah, let's just give people to the hands of Satan for a month. No, we don't do that. That's not the posture of the church. That's why the enemy has to sow false teachers to blind us. We are the most equipped army in the world. We are the most equipped in teaching in the world. We are the most equipped in breaking the power of fear. We are the ones who carry the literal spirit of boldness. But what do we do with it? What could I do if I were an enemy of the church, which I am not, but if I were, what would I do if I knew they had the only answer? Because the war in the spirit realm is the same war. What's the war for? Satan was kicked out of heaven. 2 Corinthians 11 says, Paul said, I'm troubled lest the simplicity of Christ has gone away from you, lest the same way the serpent deceived Eve, he has taken your mind away from the simplicity of Christ. When he was kicked out of heaven, he realized I cannot be on God's throne. There's only one other throne he can take, yours. Where is that throne? Right here, human lives. His goal is the same as God's. Get as many into my kingdom as I can. His goal is humans. He doesn't care if you build a $50 billion organization. He's not using the media in this generation to corrupt people. He's using the media to blind people. So there is no God. You don't need that. Choose your own life. You can be whatever you want. You can turn into an animal if you want. You can, you can be, you have your rights. And he's trying to make a God, the four letter God, the most powerful demonic God on the earth, the four letter God called S-E-L-F. Self, because if he can cut humans off and make them feel like they are little gods in themselves, then all of a sudden they will walk blindly, thinking happily, smiling into hell. His goal is to take the very essence of God's creation into his own destruction. And that was the craving of Jesus too, but not into destruction, into eternal freedom. He craves human lives. Well, something happened to me several years ago where I was preaching every Sunday in pulpit to pulpit. It was amazing. Um, you know, I've been preaching like this, traveling since probably around about 2011, 2010. And, uh, and I was traveling and preaching and every day I'd tell people about Jesus. And I received a phone call when I was in Reading. And this phone call did not change my life, but the circumstances did. This phone call happens and it's my mother. And I'm used to getting a call from her from Australia, you know, once a month or so and once every two weeks or something. And it's, hey, Ben, how are you? You know, all that sort of stuff, normal stuff. We miss you. And this was different. I answer the phone and she screams, Ben, screaming, Ben. I said, whoa, mum, whoa, what's, what's wrong? I thought somebody's died or something. I said, what's the matter? She says, Ben. She goes, your brother. Yeah, yeah, your brother, your worship leading Brother has renounced Christ. I said, Mum, I said, Mum, listen, are you sure? I said, you can read into things sometimes, Mum. This is probably not right. I said, it's probably, he hasn't renounced. She goes, listen to me, Ben. She's screaming. He has renounced God. And now he's in the casino every night from 12 o'clock till six in the morning. And he told me, I want nothing to do with church. Now I freak out a bit. I try to get a hold of my brother, he won't talk to me. I get off the phone with my mother and I just lose it. I start bawling my eyes out, I'm weeping, saying, God, please, please save Sam. Get him, Jesus, save him, God, save him. I'm weeping, it was true. 
But then the next day I got up again and, and I started to think of him again and Father, save Sam. And I start weeping again, save him. God, it's not right that he's in the enemy's hands. Save him. Next day, oh Father, save Sam. Next day, I'm on a plane somewhere. Next minute, I'm at a pulpit somewhere. I'm training someone. I'm preaching to someone. Next day, no prayer. Next day, no prayer. Next day, no prayer. Next day, no prayer. A few weeks later, phone rings again. It's my mother. I didn't even realise what was happening to me. I didn't feel it. It was just like this haze of busyness. See, we have a Christian acceptable sin. In fact, it's almost a celebrated sin. You are busy with God, that means you, everything must be about God. You can be so busy that your heart turns off. My mom calls, Ben, she's screaming, pray for Sam, pray. What's wrong, mom, what's wrong? He's injecting drugs. If you knew this boy, you could not put that reality near him. He didn't have tattoos, he wasn't a, a drug dealer. He was a soft hearted boy. I found out later what happened. He struggled with pornography. He told a few people in his worship team. They stepped him down for a little bit. That's a normal thing to do, that's right. You can't have leaders who are living double lives, but they, they didn't step him down and say, we're gonna help you. They shamed him. And they started to say, now I'm not blaming the church because we all make mistakes in the house of God. But listen, what I'm saying to you is we have to be very careful that when someone sins, we don't become a Pharisee. Just wanting them to get worse. Let's make them feel so evil and let's leave them in their mess. And my brother rebelled against this because the pastor of the church told everybody that he'd watched pornography or started to tell the people, the, the staff and everybody. And, and he felt very shamed. But the shame of sin is really what did that because if there was no sin, he wouldn't have had that consequence. So we can't blame the church again. But what I'm saying to you is this, that took it did something in his heart and, and then it was a chain reaction. But now it's gotten so bad that he is given to sin. He's not sinning, he's given back to its nature. And you know someone's conscience is really dying when they start injecting heroin or speed into their arm. Now he's sleeping with prostitutes. Now he's in a dark, dark place. He is Luke 15, he's a prodigal now. He's a prodigal, really prodigal. I get off the phone with my mom. God, no, not Sam. He was a pure worship leader, not Sam. The next day, Father, please get Sam. Next day, Sam, Sam. Next day, it's gone, it's gone. I'm busy. I'm in the will of God and I was in the will of God but something had happened to me. Several months later, around about nine months later, I went back to Australia and I saw him. And when I saw him, things changed. I looked at him, his eyes were black underneath. He wouldn't look at me. He wouldn't look at all at me. He was just ignoring me. He wouldn't look in my eyes. And I was like, that feeling, you know when you see someone who's covered in death and so, you're just like, oh, it's just my heart sunk but still I wasn't changed yet. You have to, let me paint this more clearly to you. I am a preacher. I talk about eternity and yet there's a part of me that is completely shut off. How is that possible? Well, how is it possible for you? How is it 96% of the church doesn't care that their family's headed to hell? No, no, Ben, we do care. Yeah, we all get to the front and say we care. But the caring part is not what we say. It's what we make a priority. If I care about my Netflix favorite show, I'll get home on time because it's a priority. If I care about Jesus' heart and ministering to his desires, I will care about this. I'll make it a priority. So here's what happened. I saw him, broke my heart. Then I saw in his room, I noticed there was a trash can. In the trash can was a Bible and his journal. The thought went through my mind, I should pick that up. 
I grabbed the journal, I grabbed the Bible. The thought in my mind was very evil. It was a fleshly thought. The thought was maybe one day he'll get saved. Maybe? <laughs> maybe? What was I thinking? Maybe. I walked into the room where I was staying in my mother's house. I didn't live there anymore. I was a minister full time, pretty much. I felt for some reason to open his journal. I would never do that, journals are private, but I felt to do it. By this point, he's addicted to drugs. He's about to leave the house. He doesn't want to live there anymore. And uh, he's full of demons. I open his journal like this, and I'm sorry for the extreme reaction of what happened, but I want to paint it as it happened. I opened the journal up and I read, Dear Lord Jesus, I love you so much. I'm in love with you, God. I'll do anything for you, Lord. And as I'm holding the journal like this, just holding it, reading it, as I'm reading, I start to shake. And scripture says in Romans that the spirit takes over us with groanings which cannot be expressed. I haven't had that happen many times, but it happened this time. How many times have you had that groaning? We sometimes have that when we pray in the spirit, but this was different. I was overtaken. I start shaking as I read it like this, and I'm reading more. Lord, use me. And all of a sudden, I felt as if Jesus was in me reading the journal. And I realized, oh, straight away, I realized He has read every journal entry you have made. He has personally read every single entry you have written. And Jesus has taken it as covenant. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says in Deuteronomy, when you make a vow to the Lord, pay it. And it says, because you vowed freely. God didn't even ask for it. He said, you vowed freely, but the Lord doesn't take it like it's just a, a joke. He takes it so deeply. And as I'm reading this, I started to feel the Lord weep through me. And I felt the undiluted love of Jesus for a human being. It was shocking. It scared me. I felt undiluted love. Like when people say, I haven't felt the love of God. I have, it was really scary. It's so deep. I'm shaking and I went ah! like that and I fell to the ground and I was uncontrollably weeping for the next, I'd say 45 minutes. And out of my mouth just came these words, get him Jesus, get him Jesus. And I started to pray interesting prayers like this. I bind him to the cross of Calvary, to the work of Calvary. I bind him to your blood. Get him, Jesus. And my heart, and this is what God wants to do in you today. The veil in my heart, Isaiah 26 says, God removes the covering cast. The veil in my heart that was a veil of familiarity was removed. It was taken away. My familiar feeling to, he's my family, it'll all work out. What if it didn't? Not long after this, my brother had a severe motorbike accident. Severe. He was doing, I think, 60 over the speed limit. He went through a tree. But what had changed in that moment when I was on the ground was this. I got up off the ground and my mother saw that happen. She went, she found me in the room. She came out, and, and by the way, just tell me, someone wave at me when I need, I've got five minutes left. I, I don't see a clock, so we, we good? Pastor Brian's good? Okay. So I, I, what changed in me was I got off the ground alive. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. I have to touch this because there's too many people who have misunderstood God in this nature. I want you just to put your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read this in just a minute, but I want to finish what happened. But we need to see the heart of the Lord here. Okay, 1 Corinthians 9. So I knew when I got off the ground, I'm a busy man. I got off the ground awake, very awake. And I realized, David, I was asleep in that area. I was even preaching about winning the lost. But with my brother, I was asleep. 
I was too familiar. I hadn't ministered at all to God's desires. I hadn't even asked him to change me. So I knew that's not going to happen again. I felt raw love and I could feel the longing, the craving of Jesus for my brother. Luke 15 makes sense to me now. The father looked at the balcony longing, when will my son come home? So I put a picture on my phone of his face because I knew our world is busy. I'm going to be distracted again. I placed the photo there. And then whenever I'd see the photo, I'd begin to pray. I'd just do a text and I'd see my brother. I'd go, Father, I thank you for him. Get him, Jesus. Save him, Jesus. I bind him to the powerful work of the cross. He belongs to you, not to Satan. Get him, Jesus. Open his eyes. Make him feel empty. See, some of you are praying for your neighbor. You're praying, bless them. Don't pray, bless them. No, pray this, God, make that cocaine empty, make it not work. Make the false pornography that they've placed their trust in, make it not work. Make all the money that they're getting not satisfy their soul. Pray that they would be awake. Pray that they would grope for God. And that's what I begin to pray. Get Him, Jesus, get Him, Jesus. But this was different now because my heart was awake. So my faith was awake. It wasn't an assumption, I was in partnership with God. Partnership. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 9. Paul is just like me and you, Judah. He's just like us. Paul the Apostle was a man. Paul the Apostle had a will. Paul the Apostle got tired. Paul the Apostle got, he had things come against his prayer life. He's just like us. I love this about Scripture. He shows us, God shows us that we can overcome and our heart can be changed. So here in in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is talking about the gospel and the necessity of it. Look at verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. Verse nine, it's not boastful. And he says, woe is me. I have nothing to boast of for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Do you know what the word woe means? It means like this, if I don't preach the gospel, my whole life is destroyed. It's woeful, it's empty, it's devoid of purpose, it's dead. It's a very extreme language of Paul. Woe is me, my life will fall apart if the glory that I have received does not touch somebody the way it touched me. He was exceptionally motivated. Paul also said he lived with the resurrection and the death of Christ in one body. In other words, he did not forget where he was saved from. Have you forgotten? Are you sure? Have you become too familiar around the glory of heaven that you've forgotten the destruction of hell? What is coming to your family? What eternity is heading to their doorstep? This is vitally important to you because you don't wanna get into heaven where Jesus wipes away the tears from your eyes and shows you, precious daughter, you are saved. This has nothing to do with your salvation. This has nothing to do with whether He loves you. This has nothing to do with performance, but I don't wanna get to heaven and go, God, you ministered to me, but I never ministered back and all of my family's in hell. I don't want those tears wiped away from my eyes. I don't want those tears. I wanna look at my family and go, you made it. And I wanna know I did all I could, all I could to share the truth with them. So here Paul says, woe is me. Verse 17, for if I do this willingly, I have a reward. So in other words, when you walk down the street, God says, stop. If you're like, yep, okay, I'm on an outreach. Here I go. Jesus loves you. Can I pray for you? You stop. That's you doing it willingly. But what does Paul say to us here? If I do it willingly, I get a reward. The one person that I preach to, Jesus will reward me. But if against my will, I've been entrusted with a stewardship. What's Paul saying to you and me? I feel the same way you do. Paul's driving home to his hotel in Jerusalem and the Spirit says, stop that man on the side of the Jerusalem wall. Preach to him. Oh God, I'm so tired. 
but against my will. Why is this important to us? Because we think it's just sovereign God will save. No, it's a partnership. God is sovereign. He can save anyone He wants. But in Europe right now, 2.5% of Europe are saved. Does Jesus want only 2% of people? No, He desires all men. So where is the the problem here? Where's the the problem where there's no connection between the house and the heart, the head and the, and the, the feet? Where's the problem? The problem is, Paul said, even on my worst day, When I'm tired, if the Spirit leans me to do it, I will still go against my will. And then what does he say you get? You don't just get one reward for the one gospel share, you get a stewardship. What does this mean? God will give you thousands. You'll become stewards of salvation. You become stewards of bringing the gospel into the earth. Stewards of the glory of God. Stewards of a move of God. We're all praying for revival, but we're not gonna have a revival unless we can go against our will and follow the will of our Father. So Paul said, I go against it. And then look at verse 19. And then I'm gonna finish the story about my brother. Verse 19 says this, for though I am free from all men, say, I am free. free. Is that true? Your salvation doesn't depend on man, right? Nor on works. You are free from all men. Though I am free, what does Paul say? I have made myself. Who made him? Did God force him? I have made myself a servant to all. Why, Paul? Why would you do that? Why would you give your will to serve people that way? That I might win more. That was it that less go to hell, that less go into judgment, that more escape the judgment, that my brother, that your sister, that your unsaved atheist father escapes the eternal judgment, that I might win more. So we think it's a question of sovereignty. No, 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 friend. It's a question of surrender. So I wasn't awake to this. I woke up and then I had to surrender. And so I said, Father, get him. Father, get him. And continually I did this. But this time I didn't pray with desperation. I didn't pray with like some kind of, oh no, you have to get him. I could feel the love and the faith. Jesus, you will. Why? Because I know 1 John. I don't stand on my thoughts. 1 John says, if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. If we know that he hears us, we have the petitions we ask of him. Why? Because we pray according to his will heart, his will. So I begin to say, get him, God. Send angels, send angels to that casino. Save him, Jesus. Get him. Let the drugs wear off after two minutes. Let everything feel empty to him. Then I flew back again a year later, nine months or so later, to Australia. And this time when I saw my brother, I didn't care how he looked. I didn't care if he looked like he was death warmed up. I just wanted to see him. My heart was in love with him. I could feel that love. It was in me deep. He could have yelled at me. He could have looked at me and gone, you know, cussed at me and said all things that wouldn't have affected me. The love had grown in me through the groanings. I was now in a covenant with God. I was in a commitment with God. I was in a partnership with God. I was together with the Lord. And I could sense the Lord. We were together I was not an elder brother Christian. I wasn't saying, oh, well, my brother's gonna be fine. One day he'll come back, what a terrible sinner. I wasn't talking to my neighbours anymore about how bad my brother is. Do you realise life and death is in the power of the tongue? What are you saying about your unsaved sister? What are you saying about your unsaved best friend? Don't worry how bad they are. Remember how bad you were? You turned out all right? Because the Son of God is mighty to save. He's mighty. So I saw my brother again and he looked at me. He was dark, but I was talking to my mom. I was like, mom, he's gonna get saved. I said, you and me keep praying. We agree, if two or more agree on, uh, concerning anything on the earth, it shall be done. We bind him to the cross of Calvary, Matthew 18, 18. We loose the glory of God on his life, save him, Jesus. And then one day I'm sitting in the couch like this, uh, the kitchen like this with my mom and we're just talking. I was only there for several weeks in Australia. You know, I'm living in, in Reading. And my brother walks in like this. He goes, hey, uh, hey, Ben. Hey, mom. Hey. I said, hey. 
And he goes, hey, uh, you know, he's been injecting, he's been terrible, dark sin. He goes, hey, um, are you going to church Sunday? And I was like this. I was like, I go, yeah. <laughs> I tried to play it cool, you know, I didn't want to wreck anything. I was like, mm -hmm, yeah. And then, and then he goes, he's like, okay. He goes, uh, could I get a ride with you? And I'm like, if you want. <laughs> you know, so cool, like just play. And, and then and he, go, he goes, yeah, yeah, I'd like to go with you. And I said, okay, we'll leave around 9.30. And he goes, all right. And he walked back to his room and I ran, I ran, I ran back. I went back to the room. I went back in, I ran in that room where God threw me on the ground. I ran there and I went like this. <clears throat> and then I came back up. I walked back in the house, back into the other. I was like, <clears throat> yeah, so just, just be ready at 9.30. <laughs> and so when we get 9.30 comes, Sunday morning, and I am just filled with God, filled with faith, but I'm protective. I know church, I know charismatic church. And I said, hey, I said, Sam, you just sit right next to me. He sat next to me right there and I was worshiping kind of like this, I was praising, I didn't want, I'm not ashamed of God. I'm not gonna live, play that game, but I was like this, worshiping and I was looking, you know, how's he doing? <laughs> My only thought was, God, please keep all these weird Christians away from him. That's it, that was my only thought. Sure enough, at the end of the worship, some lady sees him, she goes, whoa! And she walks up to him and I'm looking, I'm like, get away woman, this is my brother's salvation. I was like, get out of here. I looked at her, I was like, bless you. Whoa, you Ben's brother, whoa! I was like, yeah, he's, he's my brother. You're about to meet him in heaven if you keep this up. You know, she's, I didn't want him to freak out in church. He hasn't been to church in years. I don't want someone just falling on top of him. And she goes, wow, you're Ben's brother. And she goes, wait, God just told me to give you a drum kit, a drum kit. And I looked at her, I was like, you better get the drum kit. His eternal salvation depends on this. And, she, and he said, uh, I don't play drums. I don't play drums. He doesn't. And she said, I don't know why God's telling me. Sure enough, Tuesday, two days later, she knocks at the door with a drum kit. I couldn't believe it. She actually got one. My brother put it in his room and he's like, what am I supposed to do with this? I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know why God gave it to you. Maybe God's trying to remind you of your worship leading in the past. But he's like, no, 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 no. He's just trying to throw it all off. He didn't get saved in that service. But I have a sneaky praying mother. My mother said to him, the next week, we are having a home group at our house on Friday night. And she said, Sam, it just so happens that the worship leader can't come. I think my mother told them not to come. And she said, come, you lead worship. He said, I'm not a Christian. She said, but you know those old songs, don't you? But at this point, we're in the backdrop. Get him, Jesus. We bind him to the cross. Every demon spirit, get off his life. We are in the background. We are praying. We are contending. We are awake. He starts leading worship and he starts singing a song about the blood of Jesus. And the whole worship group knows he's not saved. And they're watching him. Everyone's sort of worshiping, like watching him. <laughs> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Right? He's, and then all of a sudden, oh, and he falls over, over on the ground on top of the guitar. He falls and all of us look at him and we're like, Get him. We just jumped on him. We jumped on top of the guy and we said, get out devil, every devil in Jesus' name, every addiction, every stronghold, get out now in Jesus' name. My brother stayed on the ground for two hours. He stayed under the glory of God for two hours. He got up off the ground after two hours with no addiction, no demon, everything was gone, everything. That is our King. He's mighty to save. But we have to partner with His heart. My brother came out of that whole thing cleansed. Spirit, soul and body. I left after that to do a ministry trip. My life was, it's just so deeply touched and moved. I came back two weeks later. My brother picked me up from the airport. I looked at him, my heart sank. If Judah, if you can come up in just a few minutes. My heart sank. And all of a sudden I see his eyes black again. And I went, oh no. I knew, I was like, no, he's backslidden. He's gone back. I knew it. And I was like, hey, Sam, and he was very quiet. 
And I got in the car with him. I said, hey, Sam. He's like, hey, Ben, are you smiling? I was like, I see smiling. He said, I said, hey, are you okay? He goes, yeah. I said, you don't look so good. And he goes, oh, he goes, I've been praying every night from 8 p.m. till 8 a.m. And I said, what? And then he said, yeah, and Jesus appeared to me in a dream yesterday. And now, and then, and he's like, and I think I met my wife. And then I was like, hang on, God, this is too good, this package. Like, you know, this, I haven't even, (laughs) all this stuff. My brother met his wife. He became radical for Jesus. He ended up becoming a pastor. This is a picture of him leading worship. This is a photo of him. There he is right there. You see the woman? See the woman? That's his wife. Go to the next picture. He also finished his degree. There's the next photo. There he is. He went back to university. He finished his degrees. His whole life was transformed. But you know what happened? I was transformed. I went from holding my will from this is my convenience to against my will to please God, please baptize me and awaken me with your love. Please, Lord Jesus, do not let my family and friends be taken by a rebellion against God into the hands of Satan. Please, Jesus, wake me up. Let me crave the way you crave. There's so many more verses. There's literally about 40 more verses I could share with you that describe like God is just so good. God in Ezekiel says, I saw you coddling in blood, helpless, weak, and I came and I rescued you. I feel the Lord wants to give to ascend not the ability to rest with Jesus here, but the ability to carry his heart into your unsafe friend's life. He doesn't want this church to stay at three, 400, whatever. He doesn't want that. There's more that he loves and they live here and they live back where you live, but he needs you to be awake. So I'm gonna pray a very bold prayer. And you know what happened to me was really extreme. It was very extreme how God threw me to the ground. And uh, one thing I love about this community, I can feel it, you're open to the Spirit. So whatever the Spirit of God does in this moment, I would encourage you to allow it to happen. For some of you, you're gonna feel like, like let's just be honest, who feels here as I was, sharing with you, you've had that haze of familiarity on your heart, that you've been too familiar with people's salvation. Just put your hand up, don't be ashamed. Look, it's everybody. It's everybody. We are the most equipped. God does not forget your family, Acts 16. You and your whole household can be saved. But you've got to let God mark you. You've got to kind of let Him defibrillate and shock you back to life in this area. And then from that point, you put their face somewhere. You put them on your, your fridge, a picture of them. And every time you open the fridge, you stop for 30 seconds. I bind them to the cross of Calvary. Get them, Jesus. Save them, Lord. And you begin to start moving with the Spirit in the work of salvation. And it's easy. It's easier than you think. It's glorious when it happens. But you've got to let God remove that haze and that veil of familiarity. So I want you to be very bold. And if it breaks open here and you are a weeping mess, allow that work to happen. That's what happened to me. Allow it to happen. If you just have someone remove this, please. Thank you, friend. Great Holy Spirit, You did not come to the earth and anoint Jesus and be upon Jesus just for church. You came to crave that which is lost. You came not only for us in this room, you didn't come for all these people out there in other churches, you came for the whole world. 
And God, we understand today, it's not the great suggestion, it's the great commissioning. And we wanna be changed today. We wanna be commissioned today. We want to feel Your heart that we might remain in that motivation. Because if we do it by law, we will burn out. But if we feel Your heart, we will be awake. And Holy Spirit, I ask, would You show them faces of the people in their lives that You wanna save? Those in their lives who are under the captivity of sin and the enemy. Show them faces right now. And if that is you and you want God to awaken you and you don't care what it looks like at all, as fast as you can, run to the front, just lay down on this floor as fast as you can. Don't, if you don't care what it looks like and you want that, you wanna be awake. Every house of God across the entire world is a house of salvation. Some houses are more prayer homes and some houses are healing houses. Some are worship communities and 24 seven, but every one of them will have two things. Adoring the Lord and bringing the Lord to a dying world because that's how we minister to God. Okay, I'm gonna pray a simple prayer, but would you join with me in this prayer? And remember, let whatever happens, happen. Pray this with me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, would You forgive me for forgetting Your heart toward the lost? Father, would You give me the gift of love for unsaved people? Remove any haze, any veil of familiarity that I would be used by You in partnership with You to see multitudes saved. Now, Holy Spirit, break me open. Give me Your groanings. Do whatever You want in this moment that I would sense Your love for my family and friends. Give it to her, Lord. Give that to her. Give that to the power of that intercession to her. However it looks, Spirit go deep. If there's prayer team here, you can just lay hands gently on people. Pray that they would be so awake. Yes, we bind them to the cross of Calvary. We ask you to get our family, get our friends. We pray, King of glory, that you would save mightily.